Welcome to the Daily Word verse by verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we study the book of Romans. Keep in mind, I am using the Holman Christian Standard Bible. So if you're using a different translation, the read is different, but the message is the same. We're going to pick it up in chapter 5. And in verse 1 it says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, this chapter is going to be a very impactful chapter where Paul jams a lot of good knowledge for us. Um, but before, I, I want to go back and just remind us when he says we have been declared righteous by faith. What does that statement mean? The only reason why I want to go back and rehash what we've covered in chapter 3 and some in chapter 4, just a couple of scriptures, is because there are multitudes of denominations and churches who teach a work, a salvation by works. Um, in one form or another. In other words, they teach man has to do something. Man has to perform something. Man has to keep performing something or doing something to keep the salvation that they think they have to earn. So when he says that we have been declared righteous by faith, what does he mean by that? And then he's, and he caught, when he says, he also says we have peace with God. Now, we did define this word peace, but, we, but briefly, let me go back because it's important what he's saying. He says, we have been declared righteous by faith. I'm going to go back and rehash that, but then he says, but we have peace with God. Now, there are two definitions of peace in the New Testament. One is the when your being, your mind, your soul is disquieted, discomfort. The calmness of the soul. I'm depressed. I'm bugged out or whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. The peace that calms your soul. And that is, of course, used in the scriptures. But most of the use of the word peace in the New Testament is the peace we have with God. That's the result of being alienated from God. And then we'll get further into that as we move down into this chapter. Let me go back and read something in chapter 3. And I'm going to read in uh, verse 24. He says, uh, They are justified freely by His grace. And remember the word um, just, it's the process, the act of making a person right with God. It is the act of making a person right with God. He says, so they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Remember, we talked about this word redemption. Jesus buying up the sin debt, our sin debt before God. Jesus buys it up. And then he says, and then God presented him as propitiation through faith. In the word faith again. Through faith in his blood. The blood was the price of redemption. This is what Jesus paid for our canceling our sin debt before God. Now, the reason I want to show that is because notice he says God presented Jesus as propitiation. Remember the word propitiation is that the sacrifice that satisfies. In other words, God was satisfied with what Jesus did not with what we do. There is nothing that we can do that would satisfy God. But Jesus satisfied God. And then God presents him to us to say, this is what you believe in. So when he says right here that we have been declared righteous by faith, remember that's what God presented. He didn't present a list of works, which is silly since we had the Old Testament law. 
Um, in chapter 4, he says, Therefore it was credited to him for righteousness. Just talking about Abraham's faith. And remember, faith is the way of salvation. So we, see, we have what the work of, that God does, which is his grace. His grace is poured out in the sacrifice of Jesus. So everything that went into getting Jesus to the cross... Dying for us on the cross, that's God's grace. And it's the only thing that we could do is receive it. We, we, you can't contribute your part to that. You can't contribute to the, your salvation. God is not satisfied in what anything you do. Remember, you start off with God looking at you. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no righteous one, no, right, no not one. So when the finished work of Christ is said and done, the only thing that we as human beings can do is receive it. So he says, um, now it was credit to him, now it was credit to him, was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. And it would be credit to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead he was delivered up for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Notice, he was that. So you cannot contribute in any way to your salvation. Now, one other thing that, that, that kind of just left out at me right here was um, that it wasn't written for Abraham alone, but for us all. It's kind of a sidebar bar note, but um, the, the, the scriptures are written so that it is a message to the entire body of Christ throughout all generations. So, though, for example, Paul is writing this letter to the, uh, to the Romans, he is also, it is written for the believers. And so this statement uh, supports that in that what was written about Abraham, what was done for Abraham, served as a message to us, as Paul is saying here, to us who believe. So he come so when he says in verse one again in Romans chapter five, he says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith. So again, everything that God has done for us in Christ, this is the grace of God. The only thing that we can do is receive it. So notice he said, We have been declared righteous by faith. <coughs> I mean, that's what he means by that. That we are declared righteous by faith. In other words, our part is by faith. We receive it by faith. And then as a result, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Verse 2, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now what is this hope? Notice he said, in hope of the glory of God. Now we're not going to get into this now, but we'll probably get further into this in chapter 8. This hope of the glory of God. So then he says in verse 3, not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that afflictions produce endurance and endurance produce proven character and proven character produces hope. Now again, we're going to come back to this word hope because he's, he's, why is he mentioning it, this term hope? Because in this life, that's what we have. Our faith, which is hope. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when he mentions the word hope, we don't see it now. And you don't feel saved. You don't feel uh, new. So then he says, so the afflictions make us feel anything but new or saved. But he says that the afflictions, notice he says, produces endurance. In other words, some of your translations will say patience. So it produces endurance or patience. And then endurance and patience produces character. Now, just a little clarification on the terms character, and then of course proven character <coughs> produces hope. Well, the idea about character, um, uh, trials don't make you good. 
Uh, there was a story where Jesus told in Matthew chapter 7 about two individuals who heard his word, but one did not do the word, the other one did the word. So he likened the one who didn't hear the word to building a house on sand. He says when the storm came, it blew and it uh, blew down his house. The other one who heard the same word and experienced the same storm, but because he, by hearing and doing the word, he, he was likened to building his house on rock. And when the storm came, his house stood. The bottom line to this is that you have to have the character that's already there. Hard times and afflictions don't produce good character. The characters have to uh, be there. What he is saying is that good character is proven by your hard times or afflictions. All right, I'll pick it up in chapter, I mean, in verse 5 in the next video. I'll see you then.